Welcome back to the Climate Action Stage, where we've got a creative session for you exploring AI in the arts, specifically the New Real Observatory. This programme invites leading digital artists to experiment with environmental data sets, climate models and processing pipelines to fuel a new generation of technology conscious aesthetics situated in our connection with land, water, air and energy. I'm pleased to introduce your host to tell you more, Dr. Drew Hemant. Drew is Chancellor's Fellow and Reader at Univers uh, Edinburgh Futures Institute within the University of Edinburgh, where he leads the experiential AI group and is principal investigator of the New Real in partnership with Edinburgh's festivals and the Alan Turing Institute. He's a member of the Turing's Arts, Humanities and Heritage Steering Group and the Turing AI and Arts Interest Group. And also Eliza Easton. Eliza is head of the policy unit within the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre of Nesta, the Innovation Foundation. Eliza works with economists and data scientists to analyse and develop policies for creative economy, and then with policy makers to see them enacted. Over to you, Eliza and Drew. Thank you so much, and I'm really just thrilled to be in this digital space with you guys and in this real space um, with the people on this panel. As you've heard already, um, this is going to be a really exciting, very fast-moving session. It's going to touch on areas like AI in the arts, um, net zero, both obviously priorities for Turing, and is really going to launch the New Real Observatory. To give you a couple of minutes on um, some of the context of this session, I just wanted to talk about the creative industries. So the UK has really world-leading creative industries from film, architecture, computer games, fashion, design. And um, prior to COVID, uh, it was growing at uh, twice the rate of the economy, employing more than 2 million people, worth over 100 billion pounds. And actually, even during COVID, um, you'll hear uh, about some of the ways that the creative sector as a whole and arts design and parts of it in particular have found ways around the pandemic's challenges. As people um, here will know, and certainly online will know, the UK is also a global leader in AI research behind only the US and China in its activity levels. And we did a piece of research at PEC, which looked at whether that was also the case when it came to um, the places where AI and creative intersect. And we found that they maintained that position, that there's a huge kind of global leadership role for the UK. However, um, we also see that there's insufficient recognition for the opportunity um, that the creative industries have in existing policies relating to AI. The example that I give is that in the creative industry sector vision, there were lots of hopeful um, references to AI. In the AI sector um, deal that government also made, UK Westminster government, um, they barely mentioned the creative industries. So this is an exciting but challenging context and to kind of talk about the ways that it's being addressed um, by the group in this room, I'm going to pass over to Drew. Thank you very much, Eliza. Yeah, we came together, uh, the, the, the New Real Group, around an interest and a real belief that the arts and sciences can help to answer each other's questions. Uh, for many years, I've worked alongside uh, artists who are themselves uh, technology practitioners, and in particular, artists who are really pushing boundaries in the creative potential of AI. And we were interested, firstly, how we could connect that community to the really significant science, you know, the key advancements in the field. But also, we have this idea, this belief, that practice in the arts can also solve some major challenge for the sciences and for the, the country and the economy uh, as a whole. Firstly, the arts are a site for real-world applications of AI, but also artists help us to reframe problems and to think in different ways about some of the really profound transformational questions that AI is asking us today. So our vision uh, is a, a big one, a bold one, um, and we're really interested in exploring transformative ideas through arts and AI. And our vision is to equip future generations to flourish on a thriving planet. Our research themes uh, really jump off from this. We have uh, today 
um, relaunched our website with a number of reports where we set out a vision for transformative new research agenda for the coming decade in AI and the arts. And through our work, through the experiments that we've conducted so far, we've identified what we and our community see as really promising directions for research and development. And they include, on the one hand, you know, creative tools for artists, creative AI. It also is about challenging thinking and opening up new paradigms for human-centered AI. Um, we're interested in how this work can tackle societal and, for us today, environmental challenges. And then we're interested in how this can not only generate significant new artistic works, but also help to solve really concrete challenges in areas of, of you know, current AI uh, research, such as explainable AI or XAI. So that's an introduction. As Eliza said, it's a big day for us. We're launching the New Real Observatory, uh, as well as the reports I've mentioned. We invite you to join us on our website, newreal.cc. But Eliza, back to you to introduce the rest of the session. Um, thanks. That was really brilliant kind of short introduction, but we're going to be diving in much deeper, as I said, fasten your seatbelts for this session. Um, but as well as fastening your seatbelts, if people are interested in sending in questions, we're going to try and make sure there's time for Q&A at the end. So if you can use Slido, send those questions in, and I'll definitely try to get as many to the panel as possible. Um, but to start the session, uh, actually, um, some of the artists involved in the project are just going to give a single sentence um, revealing their, the concepts kind of built on the New Real Observatory platform. So let's see that. I'm currently working on an AI research project that visualises what Londoners might lose and what will remain in a future where heavy rainfall will lead to flooding on the Thames Path in 2040. Referencing Disney's Go Away Green, a colour engineered to hide unsightly yet necessary objects in theme parks, the overlay calculates the local colour green for any place on the planet and juxtaposes this with the traditional intelligence and craft of Spain's last colourist, Antonio Santu. Photographic Cues explores the future of the photographic image in an algorithmic age and brings to view a speculative fictional future in which features of the natural landscape such as the body of water in a Scottish loch are the only remaining form of analogue lens. My project is an experiment in combining computer vision and artificial intelligence to interpret the power potential of objects in the natural environment, the relationship to energy systems, and to reimagine our landscape in the context of climate change. Hello again. Um, so before we learn a little bit more about the New Real Observatory platform and its launch today, I'm just going to introduce the panel. If you guys can wave whether you're um, digitally joining us or physically joining us when I say your name. So Adam. Um, Adam is a computer vision technologist from vframe.io and is off screen, um, off screen, sorry, on screen, <laughs> not in the room, um, still learning about hybrid working. Um, Matt, Matt is a lecturer in engineering man management at the University of Edinburgh. Um, Daga, Daga is a data scientist at the University of Edinburgh. Um, Vaishak is a Turing fellow and is, yeah, did you see there? Uh, Ines is an artist who's been working for the New Real. And Lex is an artist who's been working for the New Reel as well. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Drew, to Matt and to Dagger to introduce the platform. We're just going to switch to a short film now, um, introducing it. The New Real Observatory is an interactive climate AI platform developed with and for artists. The New Real Observatory platform architecture combines localized climate modeling data with machine learning processing, which allows for multi-sensory exploration of possible futures. We wanted to do three things. 
create an accessible, usable, low energy AI tool for artists who are not themselves AI practitioners. Test strategies to make AI legible, focusing here on visual understanding of the latent space of a generative adversarial network, and enable the artists to connect global climate data to people's lives through narrative and interaction. In other words, you need a setup that first works with easy to handle small data samples, something a user might be reasonably expected to throw together. Second, does not take long to train, especially since it might take a degree of trial and error to hone their artwork. Third, produces good quality images at high resolution to more fully engage the audience with the artistic vision. And finally, allows a degree of meaningful understanding of the latent space, since we want our resident artists to craft it, from it and within it. To make matters even more complex, since we hope this AI art collaboration will shed a new perspective on the reality of global climate change, we invite our users to craft a semantic dimension in latent space for translating the raw and essentially unevocative numbers into creative, meaningful images. For example, one could use lakes as a representation of wet climate and deserts as a representation of dry climate. Then, using the climate prediction tool in the platform, you could measure the change of precipitation and move in the latent space to GAN generate an image to inspire a novel interpretation of the climate impacted futures. The opportunities to probe these dimensions are effectively endless. In order to achieve this, and in the vein of reduce, reuse, recycle, we're simply gathering and sellotaping together existing solutions. For the artists who are co-creating this platform with us, we ask them to collate two sets of images representative of their climate perspective, to submit them to the platform and tune their very own GAN. On the other side of the equation sits a collection of algorithms, the core of which is a transfer GAN, capable of training fast and on few images. Finally, we invite the artists to create compelling narratives, be it through directly probing the latent space with values of predicted variables, or through any other means they envisage telling their story. Nothing is off the table, including trying to break the system and exposing the temperamental nature of their digital helpers. The operation of the platform consists of two stages. First, the fine-tuning stage, where the algorithms are challenged to map a new dimension of environmental change. And then secondly, the exploration stage, when the algorithmic mapping of the latent space is explored by relevant climate data. As an example, for the visual processing engine, the dimension itself is pre-constructed in the fine-tuning stage to the curation of two sets of images, class A and class B. These two describe two different approaches or outcomes within the environment. Sets of up to 100 megabytes of various images are zipped and uploaded to launch the fine-tuning process. In the background, the images are unpacked and downsampled to uniform 128 by 128 pixel tiles and given to a pre-trained transfer GAN to interrogate, map and compress onto a linear latent space vector connecting the two classes. At the core of the exploration stage are the platform's data streams, centered on three parameters extracted from Copernicus Climate Data Service – air temperature, precipitation and wind speed which are searchable by GPS coordinates you can extract from the map. One can select the different modeling scenarios and then future time horizon to get returned an absolute value and relative change with reference to the starting point of the beginning of 2022. Once the modeling data is returned, it can be used to probe the latent space of the pre-fine-tuned algorithm using a simple slider to represent the latent space vector. Using the modeling data and picking a conceptually relevant starting point, the scale of climate-driven change of a selected parameter can be explored by generating images from the different latent space positions. Moving the slider, one can choose the desired future casting position to generate an upsampled 512 pixel square image representing a vision of a data-driven future. 
Generative adversarial networks are both the success child and a PR nightmare of machine learning, trained through a game of cat and mouse between two algorithms. These architectures can turn your paint doodles into gorgeous landscapes, or create a deepfake of yourself as a bearded lady. How does it work? What happens is two deep neural networks compete against one another, a generator and a discriminator. The generator attempts to create a mapping between a small set of numbers and 2D color images. We call that list of numbers latent space, as it is, poetically speaking, where the images exist in potentia. The mapping is essentially a hierarchy of weighing functions that determine what pixels and pixel arrangements to mix in at what ratios. Generator starts of naive, just throwing out noisy blobs. But progressively, as it receives feedback from the discriminator, learns what combinations work. The discriminator acts as a lie detector, comparing what the generator outputs with real images and deciding whether they look believable or not. As they compete, generator trying out new combinations, discriminator increasingly suspicious, you end up with a deep fake making machine. That is, if you have a near endless supply of images and graphics cards, time, expertise, and a good deal of luck. There is a reason why it's usually that big tech giants they get to release successful or at least notorious products in this space. CANs are particularly tricky to train, since you have not only one, but two networks, and the competition between them can lead to the generative gridlock. They're very time consuming, and as with most deep AI, there is a sort of black box aspect that means interpretability typically comes at a cost. Our overarching goal is to create a GAN-enabled platform that is the exact opposite, sustainable and resource friendly, accessible, reliable and interpretable, and open source throughout so that end users can create and explore their very own latent space to fuel artistic expression. Human brains naturally order both abstract concepts, relationships and visual structure of the world. But for again, it doesn't matter in principle how ordered its latent space is. That in potential encoding can be a scrunched up space of numbers thrown together willy-nilly and it's far from trivial to tidy it up. I mean, evolution had eons to do that, and I'd still argue that human brains are messy. There are regularities in the visual world to be exploited, and the field is rapidly growing and making inroads into knowledge transfer and few short learning, as well as latent space smoothing. Thus, we hope to facilitate the artist to create significant artistic works for online and in-person audiences that explicitly link locally curated image datasets with the global climate data and to describe the future environmental transformation with the help of imaginative AI. We hope you join us on our journey of exploration. Hi, welcome back. I um, hope you enjoyed that video. So now we're going to seamlessly move to speaking to two of the people you saw in that video in real life, all wearing slightly different outfits, um, but I'm sure you'll recognise them. We're going to talk to um, Matt and Dagger a little bit more about the platform. So Matt, could you talk to me about what your objective was when building the platform? Sure. So the main object objectives behind the Neural Observatory platform were sort of twofold. On one hand, we were very interested in the dimension of this sort of disconnect between the local experience of the environment and the global environmental data. We've known for decades about climate change, and we've had all this information effectively at our fingertips. But it was difficult to translate into everyday experiences. And so the platform, on one hand, was trying to address that whilst contextualizing it through the use of AI. And the way we did that is basically trying to create an engine which is the or unblack boxing um, aspects of the way AI operates, particularly by the way you can manipulate or, or frame what it does by using different kinds of data sets and curating data sets 
um, as a way to explore effectively how AI can help with that elusive materialization of what climate change means in everyday experience. So that's kind of the two main objectives. Uh, on one hand, get that global data connected to the local environment and use AI in the creative industries as a way to basically make AI more explicit and make the data more explicit. Yeah, I think it's really interesting and makes me think about how artists have always been at the forefront of kind of conversations about the changing environment and think about the industrial revolution, but actually have always been doing that hand in hand with technologists. Um, Dag, I'm gonna move to you now. What do you think is gonna happen next with the platform? So obviously it's kind of launched, where are we going from here? Yeah, so this, I mean, it's a little bit of first steps prototype there, and we've got a ton of ideas to, <laughs> to polish. Uh, so right now we're working with only um, vision, visual aspect and um, a single type of AI, which is uh, the GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, but we've got our um, site on um, using uh, other modalities, so um, uh, audio um, and uh, just plain text or words um, and there's diff there is similar tools to GANs, there's also different tools um, uh, and I mean um, hopefully um, multimodality um, something of the sort where you've got um, annotated images so you've got both the visual aspect and a text aspect and you might want to play with um, uh, having a text prompt to the AI and receive an image back, things of that sort. Yeah, it's really exciting and I think just, yeah, the kind of theory of it, like I said, how it's bringing artists into a world where they can understand and respond to AI in and of, the, in and of itself as a technology, but then also kind of pushing the boundaries of uh, climate activism and what that might look like, um, yeah, huge thing. So, again, we're gonna we're gonna move on. Um, and I think something useful to kind of know about the platform is that it was built out of a collaboration. We've been talking about climate with Edinburgh Science Festival, and one of the things it wanted to do was ex uh, develop an experience that audiences anywhere in the world could could take part in um, during the pandemic. And I spoke at the beginning about how, uh, you know, COVID was incredibly challenging for the parts of the creative industries that were most based on, on kind of experiences. One outcome of that collaboration was Arwen, um, which was presented at the Science Festival and um, during COP26, uh, the UN Climate Change Conference. So we're just gonna now go to a video, see a little bit more about Arwen. Inhale and exhale. Take five deep breaths. We invite you to explore a when using all your senses and be present, interacting with your environment beyond your device. When you're ready to begin this experience, please press begin. Feel the wind in your face. Feel it moving through your fingertips. As sea and air temperatures oscillate, wind speeds are accelerating. Try traveling across three different surfaces. Did any of these contain soil? If you're brave enough, pick up some soil and hold it. What does it feel like? Hi. 
Um, so I think that art and tech of any kind work best when the artists involved from the very beginning of the project. And so it's exciting um, to be talking to Ines, who was a lead artist in Arwen. Um, and I understand that you were also one of the main architects of the platform. So could you talk a little bit about how you inputted into the design of the platform? Yeah, so um, I guess after Owen, um, we, Matt and I had a series of sessions where we reflected and explored the potential of Owen, the elements that maybe didn't get pushed as further as, or as far as we would have wanted to. And we found that at the forefront, what we really wanted was to create a platform that had uh, AI and the data driven of, of an experience at the forefront. Um, in Awen, we explored four key elements, uh, land, water, air, and energy, or light. And so for this platform, we wanted to think of it as a sand pit for artists, but also one where we could add specific elements like location and time. So offering the possibility of going into the past, situating ourselves in the present, and also projecting into the future and allowing hyper-localization through location. Um, yeah, I guess that's about the platform. Um, me personally, in my work, I'm really interested in how we engage with and learn about climate. Um, I'm interested in how those forms of knowledge are produced and more increasingly recently I've been really interested in the technological mediation that occurs when learning or thinking about climate um, and the areas that technology obscures, reveals, conceals. Um, my project as part of the platform is called The Overlay and it explores the color green as a color that has been used to uphold and safeguard um, idealized, romanticized, and spectacle-driven uh, ideas of nature. Um, so I'm working with the platform to redraw and rethink of green, the color green, if uh, we stop thinking of a natural and artificial divide but think of things as interconnected systems. Yeah, I think that's really, it's really an exciting, um, it's really exciting to like go into the platform and have a play. And actually I'd say if anyone's watching, it's definitely worth doing that. After this session, obviously <laughs> don't leave now, send questions, but after you've sent your questions, have a play, because it really gives a sense of um, how kind of sensorial uh, this approach is versus you know a lot of the work that we in the PEC have been looking at even around creative industries and AI, which are academic papers, which we've kind of analysed. And, and, and this is such a different approach. So I think that's really exciting. Um, so we're now going to move again to a short video um, in which we're going to see uh, work in progress um, as described by Innes and some of our other artists. So if we can switch to that video now. I'm interested in the ways that colour has been engineered and implemented in the cultural industries and the new possibilities opened up by artificial intelligence. I will use the platform to generate the colour through the interplay of the location, a future value for the vegetation index and an image data set, and I'm interested in how the data stream of vegetation will decide the deviation from this abstract hue. So a color is calculated by an AI that has been trained to identify the hue that lies in between greenery and built environments. And the work follows attempts at making this tangible locally and the entanglements that arise in doing so. The overlay explores the impact of technology in both enabling and hindering our understanding of, and therefore our relationship with, the environment. The experience will be visually gripping, it will be immersive, poetic, and sprinkled with hints of humour and playfulness. My hope is that the work is able to help further understanding of AI and its digital literacy for the general public, 
the better understanding of AI may allow some to see how AI is already a part of their daily lives and may encourage them to engage with it more actively. I use AI to transform the body of water in a Scottish loch into a lens with which to view speculative features about the photographic image. Photographic cues invites bodies of water in the natural environment to become visual instruments and hands over photographic decision making to the natural world. Tuning into the operation of the neural network, I navigate thoughts concerning the character of the algorithmically generated image as a stimulant for visual thinking. Approaching the subject of AI with a whimsical thought, I begin to imagine a future time in which analogue image processing has become extinct, but the analogue camera lives on in new hosts in the natural environment, such as the Scottish loch. A loch becomes a site to experience the sole gift of an image surfacing from the water. I am interested in understanding how the machine learning model will become far more complex and deal with uncertainty and vagueness more than anything we could ever program. This capability of machine learning is vital for me in exploring its creative purpose as the rules are fuzzy and ever-changing and will often be bent or broken by the abstract of its generation. Um, and, and that abstractness is somewhere that I really want to focus on in this project. I would like to utilize artificial intelligence to assist in visualizing possible scenarios of how increased rainfall due to increased temperature levels can negatively affect communities in London. It's important for me throughout this whole process to ensure that the speculative visions I generate are plausible. Machine learning is simply just a tool for me in this project as it will help me to analyze the data that I have found in order to generate an output. And, you know, I hope to use these outputs from a machine learning model to help me tell this story. I wanna be able to expose the machine learning model to this data, and I'm interested to see how the machine learning model sort of understands the data I feed it with. You know, the model will never truly understand the consequence of this generation. But I think there's an opportunity to really do something interesting with it. My goal is simply to build something that can educate folks without scaring them and will allow them to contribute to a future where this doesn't happen. Hi again. Um, I feel like a proper news presenter <laughs> jumping in and out of the studio all the time. It's great practice. Um, so we've now got a really interesting conversation um, with Lex again, who's one of the artists working for the New Reel. Um, my first question is uh, kind of a broad one. As a designer, why do you enjoy working with machine learning? Um. I think my, my first sort of foray in the area was looking at how, actually how could I you, how can I build machine learning tools for creators and how can they be more creative. That was like I wanted to study it in an academic setting from a PhD perspective and then I was like thinking about how could I apply this new technology. It's not really a new technology but this sort of height technology should I say in my work and a lot of my interest was about exposing like how a machine learns and how a machine works and I was always trying to think of what are the different things I can create that would show the inner workings of a, of a machine and show that computers are stupid. That was literally my goal, <laughs> it was always that. It, they're not really intelligent, should I say, but they're more like stupid, but they also have <laughs> interest in, interest in, interest in things that they can do in it and they can achieve and they're not as scary as um, it's been framed to be by the media. So I was really trying to just demystify it. That's always kind of been my goal um, with working with artificial intelligence or machine learning, should we call it in that, in that regard. 
Yeah, it's interesting. And, and actually, um, you sent round an article on algorithmic anxiety. Uh, and it's, it, it's definitely challenging, or it must be challenging, to just avoid scaring people away from the subject, scaring artists away from the subject. And you know, what's coming through from you is that's not only in terms of it, you know, what's the future of the world going to look like, kind of catastrophizing, but also because it's just a difficult subject for all mm. artists to understand. So could you speak a little bit to some of the challenges of working? I, I guess, guess in this area? I guess with some of the work I've done in the past, you know, um, was, I, I guess, I, I once worked on a project which was looking at how we could kind of explore how facial recognition technologies is currently being used to police autonomy and authority of minority communities in particular parts of London. And I was working on a project at the time to sort of create something that shows the inner workings of a machine learning algorithm in that case. But I was, but when I came across that paper, I began to be very conscious of the things I produce. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to create stuff that tell a story that exposes an audience to something. Because I guess as a designer, I've always been trained to create experiences for an audience. Um, and it was also like, how do you get an audience to engage with this, be educated, but not leave their feeling anxious or not leave their feeling helpless? Even with a topic of climate change, with a project that I've been exploring around, you know, flooding on the Thames path and looking at how that might affect particular communities, you know, I don't even know the answers. Is if I create this experience, can we, you know, is there a possibility where we can address this? How do we address this? And and, and that was some of the questions I've been thinking throughout this project was, am I the right person to tell the story? If I tell the story, should I be telling it to my grandmother who lives in the estate that was shown in one of the pictures in, in the video earlier, or should I be sh speaking to policymakers or and saying to them that this is what could happen? We need to. This needs to be a um, priority in that case. So, I'm a bit. It's a, it's an interesting space. It's a challenging space, and um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to explore it. So, I'm just learning as I as things come along. I love, I love the way that you talked about what it means to be anxious versus what it means to be helpless. And that rings so many bells actually on climate, but also on AI. It's okay, especially for artists, I think, to make people anxious about stuff. But definitely there are artists who aim to make people feel helpless, and that's their whole thing. But I think as someone who works in policy, you never want someone to feel completely helpless. You want to be talking to them about concerns, but then where there are opportunities to change the, change the game, which there definitely are in these spaces, you want to show them that. And so I just think that's another reason why it's, it's so interesting to bring creatives in who have that interest, but then also, as you say, think about how that dovetails into policy, into tech, into science. These are all grappling with some of the same, um, some of the same questions. And could you just quickly, before we move on, uh, summarise your specific ambition for like this project with the new reel? Just, just an easy sentence to uh, summarise everything you've been working on in this project. <laughs> um, I guess I'm pretty pleased. I, I wasn't... OK, I, I'm going to struggle here, but I'm going to be quick. <laughs> Basically, seeing what the model was able to produce was kind of beautiful in a way. And I think there's an opportunity. I'm now interested in how you take the beautifulness of the abstract, how you show the original and the after after it goes through the machine and it creates this this artwork that I wouldn't be able to create. And how do you how do you position how do you create something where people can experience that and they could also appreciate probably the aesthetic creation that's happened but also the story behind um, the projects as well. So f that's where my headspace is in right now. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know, maybe in a month, in a couple months time, I might have a better answer, but this is me right now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was great. And, and yeah, totally, really love the way it can explore that abstractness of the kind of world that it's created. And it, there's such a history in art and design of wanting to explore randomness and 
abstractness and fuzzy areas. So again, although that might seem like a challenge for lots of kind of people, I think in, in arts and design there is a particular way of approaching that which, which makes sense. Um, so we've spoken really right through this session already about the need to address these huge societal questions, technological futures, questions about climate. Um, we really benefit when disciplines work together. And you know, I've been lucky to work at Nesta, which brings together huge numbers of different disciplines, um, from like data, data science to behavioral insights, but also the arts. Uh, but next up, we're going to hear two practitioners touch on exactly that, um, talking about how the arts and scienti sciences <laughs> offer um, different strategies uh, to increase the legibility of AI systems. So over to um, Vaishak and Adam. Hi everybody. Um, I could get started with a question to you, Adam. Uh, as an artist, how do you think uh, we can understand what's at stake when we encode knowledge in a neural network, which, which are ex extremely popular these days? Um, yeah, that's a, it's a big question, um, and I think that we're all looking for answers in some way in relationship to climate change, and that art is one place that we look to, but I'm not sure art is the right framing. And um, I think while neural networks and AI are incredibly advanced, um, they're also still incredibly underwhelming. Uh, naive and simple, or as Lex described, uh, some of them are not smart at all. Um, and as with many problems in, in AI re regarding related to bias, uh, the past is not well suited to describe the present or the future. And I think um, when we develop neural networks and encode knowledge, uh, we're often trying to draw from the past, which may be one of the biggest mistakes. And as an example of how um, art is related to encoding knowledge, um, we could look at the history of art and consider that prior to the Renaissance period, artists weren't really credited for their work. Um, but over time, that became much more common and then normalized. So if you imagine that artwork now seems inseparable from the identity of the creator. Uh, this may be uh, something that we could change. Uh, if you could imagine that instead of encoding that kind of knowledge or, or bias, a problematic bias into the network, um, in uh, relation to climate change, perhaps we should also encode nature as a creator or co-creator in the work, uh, which is something that we can't achieve unless we try to change the existing data structures that are, that are being used to train neural networks. Um, and this brings up something that um, we've talked about in our previous discussions, this term counterfactual, um, that I like and <clears throat> have a lot of things to say about. So do you consider, or would you consider nature as a co-creator to uh, be a counterfactual or a counter-counterfactual statement? Um, uh, so there's a lot to unpack there. So counterfactuals obviously have a role to play in explanations because like it or not, as much as machine learning, as, as you say, is, is picking up on associations. It's really, our view seems to be causal uh, in the sense that, you know, we attribute uh, some, some amount of accountability to every actor in our environment. And so counterfactuals provides a mechanism for us to think about possible worlds, how things could be. Um, about this idea whether nature is a co-creator, uh, it, of course it is in a way because every data point you collect has uh, some notion of the environment this data was collected in. Um, the question is, is, is there a means to uh, explicate how exactly this interplay happens. Uh, so for instance, as you say, when you have historical data, we have known, or we know now that there's considerable amount of historical bias encoded in it, and machine learning algorithms simply amplify that. Um, 
So we need to we need to be uh, aware of this position uh, when we think about training machine learning models and counterfactuals, and more generally, I think a causal a viewpoint uh, can uh, you know give us an opportunity to be a bit more careful in how we use machine learning. So, for instance, thinking about what would this decision look like if you were in the situation of a certain person, right? So if you were of a different gender or a different race and how would that affect you, helps us understand that technology doesn't work on the same level for everybody, right? So I think that way counterfactuals and more really, and more generally causal perspectives give you that framing uh, to put you out of that, you know, uh, data point perspective and think of the larger narrative in which these data points are collected and how it gets applied. Um, I, I mean, in that sense, uh, Adam, if, uh, you know, if I could uh, turn back to you, um, in a way, you know, uh, as you said, you've talked about this counter counterfactuals and nature co-creation, uh, but I'm wondering if you could give some more perspective. So for instance, privacy is, is a topic that you care about deeply. And how do you see that, uh, you know, interoperating with the fact that many artists seem to work with big data nowadays? Yeah, my background is in privacy, counter surveillance, bringing awareness to many of the problems that I think were created in the post 9-11 world that really shaped society um, for the, the 20 years that followed. And I think um, in terms of defining moments uh, that cause a major shift in the way people uh, think about uh, data, identity, privacy, something on that scale and probably much larger is happening now with climate change. And I'm not sure if the tactics that were appropriate for counter surveillance, which for me were normalizing narratives that were considered dangerous from a national security perspective, bringing those into fashion, uh, bringing them into art where they could be played with and not have the risk of being labeled a lone wolf or a terrorist. Um, that's all changed a lot and things are quite normal. But now we're in this um, yeah, equally uh, complex moment where I know a lot of artists, including myself, struggle to imagine what kinds of work would be relevant for climate change because there are a lot of concerns for creating work um, in the literal sense to bring something into existence um, maybe is the opposite of what we need to do to bring things out of existence, to be more minimal in our thinking, to be more aware of our energy consumptions and carbon footprints. And um, that's why for this project, I've been quite uh, challenged and struggling to come up with an approach that's very lightweight in terms of the technical implementation or the, the byproducts of the artistic creation and to, um, I think, become more conceptual because you know, concept-driven art and even identity-driven art can be um, disjoint or separated from the, the largesse of the way that art was created before. So I think it really does necessitate a large shift in, in the way that we're thinking about even the term creation itself. So let me ask you a question then. Um, where do you see a promising direction for the future of research between art and science? I mean, if I could take stock of the things that we've seen, um, certainly what we've seen in this session, uh, and generally what I've seen of artists engaging with AI, um, as has become clear uh, for many, very many reasons, vision and visual mediums are most attractive. They get the most amount of attention. And rightly so, uh, surveillance, uh, law enforcement, you know, all of these areas are rife with, you know, social technical problems, uh, uh, racial profiling and whatnot. Um, I mean, if, but, but uh, and these are incredibly important, as you say, climate science is another area where you want to reduce the computational burden of training large neural networks, that's another issue. But if we could step away from this, I do think there are deep 
uh, philosophical issues facing us uh, in this interface of AI and society, uh, things like stakeholder engagement, a uh, value alignment, how exactly do we understand machines that align with human society in terms of the ideals. What, what would this look like? Uh, there's things like responsibility and accountability. If something goes wrong, who do we point our fingers at, uh, right? And uh, you know, these are areas where at least from my perspective as a non-artist, uh, but as a person engaging and interested in art, uh, I see that you know, art can really bring out a kind of narrative, a very strong momentum to appreciate these kinds of complexities, you know. So I think it will be quite engaging, uh, for, for, uh, you know, for, for personally to see more artwork of this nature. Uh, I, I see that we're kind of out of time, but to me, that's a very promising area that you know art can really shine and do something magical that we haven't quite been able to do in the field. Yeah, I think. Though I would like to see more art that's not art and more art that's less art and more about, say, the harmony in nature and using right. artistic strategies to unfold that or to open source or reverse engineer that and bring it into the realm where it becomes more normalized. I, I do think we're out of time, though. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, so I should, we should pass it back to Eliza. Thanks, guys. Um, that was brilliant. And uh, yeah, it just makes me reflect, actually. I was thinking about nature and artists, and I was thinking about Michelangelo and the way that every sculpture that Michelangelo made was really based on the stone that he made it from and how nature was a co-creator in that. But in this way, you know, digital artists don't always have that connection to the medium, and this really brings back nature into the creative process in an interesting an interesting way. Um, we've thrown it over to you guys for some questions. We've had some really interesting questions come in. Um, and I'm going to kick off with uh, one which I think summarises a lot of kind of the discussion that's happened today in a nice pointed way um, from Andre. And um, they ask, what were some of the ways in which the creative inquiry helped enhance the more technical developments of the project? And I think I might go to Drew, should we start with you? Sure, let's. Uh, that's a good question. Um, really good question. Yeah, as we said, one of the, the goals of this project, this, goal has, this project has a number of goals. It's about equipping artists with tools. It's about supporting incredible creative practice. It's about festivals reaching audiences during COVID. And it's about addressing major societal challenges. And, and as, as Adam was saying, trying to use art and technology to shift our thinking and shift the way we work. But as researchers, we're really interested in that touch point between the arts and the sciences and what we can learn from each other. That's what, what drives a lot of the research. And, and so the question is, has the creative process informed the technology development? Yes, multiple points. We can Absolutely. probably speak to different ones. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if I gave one, so we heard from Ines, uh, a lot of the early thinking kind of was derived for, from the earlier Arwen project. And I remember a moment uh, when we were looking at the architecture. And in the early version, we had four pipelines, uh, data and AI pipelines. So climate, you know, peak climate parameters, through a climate model to get fu future values, working with different um, AI engines on either image, text, uh, sound and, or, or, or just function. And in thinking this through, we looked at it from a curatorial lens and, and thought how artists would work with this. From our prior projects, so we'd worked with amazing artists, Jake Elwes, Anna Riddler, Caroline Sinders. And so we were really aware of how artists work with AI. And a lot of it is through manipulating the data, through the training data, as well as playing with weightings in, in the model. And that insight led to a bit of an aha moment where we decided that actually this should be modular. We should disconnect the, the processing engines from the data pipelines and enable people to connect any pipeline to any processing engine. So that was one sort of, I think, technology uh, dimension that came directly from the creative and process. Do, Adam yeah. and Dagger, do you want to jump in 
Briefly. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I think it's good. So we're look, looking specifically at, at the Neural Observatory, which is kind of one of our projects. Um, yes, I think that there's there's been a lot of ways in which also then that curatorial and artistic perspective then shifted or directed or guided the way we've constructed the platform architecture. And then from there, effectively, a new epistemology starts to emerge, right? It's a new way of finding out things about both the AI as well as nature. In a sense, it is that kind of symbiotic co-creation that you know, Adam and Vaishak were kind of uh, you know, discussing. Um, you know, for instance, the way we think about latent space, right? The way we try and effectively sort of tease out how does the algorithm perceive the data that we give to it as a way to then let artists explore that data and explore that kind of curatorial input through the data sets. And I know, you know Doug, you've been working on, 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 on sellotaping things together, as you mentioned <laughs> in the video, because that's really a lot of that kind of back and forth, how, how you managed to work it out. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and it definitely um, reframed some of the stuff. So it was more working back, OK, if I'm an artist, uh, what what do I want? I want something. Um, yeah, I, I put in the data, and I want to have this the slider that we talk about that makes sense. So then it was working back. Okay, we have to cast it back. Can we do it through a gradient descent? Well, not really. So okay, we go to differential evolution. What do we do next? Um, it's still not necessarily always possible or legible. Then we go to clustering. All that kind of stuff was, um, I'm just spewing out technical stuff, but <laughs> all that was because the, of the kind of thing we, we want to give a meaningful thing for artists to play, to play with. So we have got three minutes left, um, and I'm going to kind of give the last word before a bit, a bit of rough, wrapping up. Um, to, to Lex and Ines, and I, and I was wondering, uh, Matt's asked, when does approaching a challenge or opportunity like climate or AI as an artist help, or when does it not help? So maybe if you could just, such a brief reflection, I'm sorry, mean. <laughs> so can, you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, does, when does approaching a challenge as an artist help, or when doesn't it help? When's it harder to approach it as an artist? Do you mean is it helpful for an artist to have a challenge to respond to? I think I think the question might be about <laughs> like when is it? For example, I guess I can imagine from what you were saying earlier that actually because you're trying to think about all these different ideas and parts because it can go anywhere. That's both a real opportunity where you're looking at AI, but that's also quite difficult. You don't have one specific goal. Uh, <laughs> I think Adam might also have a, a comment on that because Adam's recent yeah. colleagues was actually addressing some of, of that challenging, if we can get Zoom to Adam. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm thinking it's now to the ether. Sure. I think it, it can help to approach things as an artist because um, you're not on a fixed contract, so if you really mess things up, it's okay. And that means that you can take risks that other people can't, and I think this is I don't like to think that artists really have responsibilities or else I wouldn't want to be one to some degree, um, but it kind of is a responsibility or at least something that artists can and should take advantage of. I mean, is that they can take risks and they can do things that are eccentric, um, unpredictable, uh, that other people don't really have the affordance to um, in a job or in an academic career. So. Yeah, as an artist, it is good and risky to to make uh, bold statements that sometimes might not always be right. But in the process, there's only one way to know to start walking down that path and see what happens. Everything in some way is an improvis improvisational project because it's really not possible to fully predict where things will end up. Or if it is, then it's not a project worth doing. That's, that definitely is wise, and I think a really nice way to finish it. Um, Drew, I'm just going to pass back to you for one minute. Um, and, and just so you, so you know, the questions come in. Is there a link um, online to the new real observatory code? So maybe you could just talk very briefly about next steps. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there isn't, the code isn't uh, online yet, and actually the, the platform is not yet plug and play. Sorry. So this is our big reveal. 
Um, but our timeline is that we're developing the platform through these pilot experiences. Uh, Ines is first up with a project uh, at the uh, Edinburgh Science Festival, and then we're working with all of the artists and designers to develop experiences, and we'll be uh, developing the platform alongside that. And our ambition is to make it widely available as a pickup accessible, usable tool that people really want to use uh, and that is plug and play. So uh, we invite you to join us on this journey. Um, if you can uh, uh, visit us uh, online, you'll find all about the project, you'll find our recent reports, more about the platform at newreal.cc. We're Experiential AI on Twitter and uh, we're very grateful to, to the Turing and to AI UK for inviting us here and we look forward to, to meeting you on the journey ahead. In the new reel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much to everyone who's joined us. And there's some great questions. So I'm sure the team want to hear about them on Twitter as well. Carry on the conversation. Um, now back to the studio. Can I call it the studio? <laughs> now back to Shinny.